as I think you will know, is a uh, award-winning journalist who has been, well, running around a lot of forests for, for many years. Uh, sometimes they had wars going on in them, sometimes uh, not all times. Um, quite an adventure, a lot of stories to tell, uh, and he tells them quite well. And so um, I, as someone, so infrequently have I read the book before the meeting. Um, it's usually the meeting that encourages me to, to read the book. This is an instance where I'm very fortunate to have um, read this book and can attest that it is a uh, tremendous interest for you um, and in, in so many different policy realms, anthropological, cultural, and then just a great adventure story. Um, so it is um, terrific for us to be able to welcome Scott back to the center. Um, the center, as I think many of you know, is the formal memorial to Wilson. Uh, 1968, Congress set up the Wilson Center as a nonpartisan, non-advocacy living memorial to Wilson, reflecting his legacy as our only president to have a, a PhD. And uh, it's exactly these kinds of um, dialogues and opportunities for Scott to come here while he was writing and processing this really intense trip overseas, but also taking advantage of the fellows and the staff who are so expert in, in this part of the world and, and others as well to bounce ideas off and understand and perhaps uh, Scott in the Q&A we can reflect on how um, the, the books like these change with the conversations that come after the, the, the field work so to speak. Um, so we're pleased here at the center to be a place where um, uh, the scholar policy practice dialogue is uh, very inclusive of the journalistic perspective um, as well. Um, we passed out a bio, so I'll keep it short about Scott. He's someone, as I said, who has worked all through the world, um, particular attention in, in Latin America, um, and reported for just about every uh, news outlet that you might have read or listened to or watched. Um, and in, in those uh, different roles, um, uh, won many awards. The, this particular trip that took him uh, to the Amazon was uh, supported by National Geographic, and so you, you uh, may have read uh, uh, a sh very short version of the much longer story uh, in National Geographic and seen some of those uh, pictures there. Um, I will say, when it comes to the Q&A, we'll, we'll come up here um, just procedurally for those of us in the room, because we are webcasting the event, we'll ask that you wait till one of my colleagues comes to you with a microphone and pose your questions that way so the folks uh, online can hear as well. So Scott, I think we'll turn the, the floor over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff, and thanks to the Wilson Center, and thanks to all of you who um, are here today. It's great to see you all here. I'm just going to, um, before I get started, um, share with you um, the trailer for the book, which will give you a quick snapshot of uh, what, you're, what we're going to be discussing in the next uh, hour or so. So here it is. São vários os objetivos, mas os principais é, primeiro, dimensionar a terra efetivamente ocupada por esses povos isolados. perder e nada ganhar. Não tem nada a ganhar com isso.
So um, that is um, just a little to whet your appetite. Uh, so the story I'm going to tell you was about it was originally an assignment, as Jeff said, uh, in National Geographic, published in 2003. Um, in the meantime, um, I've done quite a lot of research and several other trips in the Amazon, which uh, inform uh, the the book. And um, it's taken a while, including a um, lengthy stint here at the Wilson Center in 2009, um, during which uh, time I um, had the um, great fortune of doing a lot of research. Uh, and that has definitely made this book um, a, a better one than it otherwise would have been. It's not only an adventure story, but also is one laced with a great deal of um, anthropological and historical research. Uh, and um, the story I'm going to tell you about originally came about, um, I got a call from National Geographic one day um, asking if I, was, um, if I would be available uh, to go down to Brazil, actually where I'd just come back from. I'd been in Brazil for a couple of months, and um, I was just getting settled into a um, summer sublet in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I was going to kind of spend the summer chilling and putting my personal life back together. Uh, when I got this call from uh, an editor at the Geographic and asking me if I would be available to go uh, profile this man, Sidney Pozuelo. Uh, Sidney Pozuelo, some of you uh, may know, um, was at the time the head of the curiously named Department of Isolated Indians of Brazil's Indian Affairs Agency, FUNAI. The Department of Isolated Indians was actually created by um, was largely the creation of Pozuelo, who uh, in the late 1980s um, engineered a sea change in Brazil's policy toward um, its isolated and last uncontacted tribes. Uh, he comes out of a hundred-year-old tradition uh, begun by Candido Rondon, whom many of, some of you may have heard that name, who took Teddy Roosevelt down the River of Doubt uh, Rondon was the um, founder of the uh, Indian Protection Service, founded in 1910, and uh, basically the first of a lineage of so-called sertanistas, um, derives from the Brazilian Portuguese word sertão, the bush. The sertanistas were the agents who would go deep into the jungles in the Amazon to make contact with uh, the so-called wild Indians of the jungle with the um, purpose of um, integrating them into the national society. Rondon was the first as an army officer, uh, led expeditions deep into the jungle to lay strategic telegraph lines uh, back at the turn of the 20th century. And as the commander of those expeditions to lay the uh, telegraph lines to link the most remote outposts of Brazil to the um, metropolitan centers on the Atlantic coast, he actually made several first contacts along the way with, um, with you know, in, in some instances, uh, bellicose tribes and others uh, not so um, warlike. But in any case, he came to the um, he came to the conclusion that um, the Indians that he met were in fact the uh, rightful owners to the land and were um, the most um, uh, efficacious uh, guardians. Um, of the rainforest, and they deserved to be um, recognized in Brazil as equal citizens as everyone else put on equal footing. And his philosophy was, so if the Indians are just given equal chance, they will flourish as Brazilian so citizens in the national society. So his pr approach was make contact with the Indians, save them from the depredations of, you know, um, the advancing frontier, and then um, help protect their lands and integrate them into the national society. Um, after decades of this policy, which um, in some instances worked okay, but in mes most instances led to uh, massive die-offs because the, the tribes have no um, immunity to the germs that um, evolved on the Eurasian landmass that European coloners, colonizers brought to the New World. The isolated tribes of the Amazon today remain every bit as vulnerable to those diseases as the first natives did who um, were encountered by Columbus 500 years ago. So Pozuelo, who himself had notched seven first contacts, 
the purpose was, you know, he went out deep into the bush, wooed the Indians, seduced them with a um, plentiful supply of gifts. Then once they were pacified, would, um, you know, put them on um, reservations or leave them on their land. But what would happen was, would be immediately the die-offs would begin, and following the demographic shock, um, the, their cultures would rapidly begin to disintegrate. In many instances, they would lose the will to, um, to live, to produce for themselves, and the will to defend their lands against intruders, which were then easily overrun. So in the late 1980s, Pozuelo led a change in p the policy of Brazil to no longer contact the last of the uncontacted tribes, but rather to identify where they are in the jungle and then um, get legal and then f legal protection for those lands and then actually go about erecting um, control posts and barricades in some places that would keep intruders from entering those lands. So uh, the work of the um, Department of Isolated Indians was um, a kind of spin, a twist um, on the old policy, um, turned it on its head, if you will. The Indians would no longer be contacted to save them, but they w the objective would be to save them without contact. So Pozuelo had been the leader of this movement that made this, uh, that, that saw this change happen in Brazil. And the magazine was interested in a profile about Pozuelo, but he was about to head off on an open-ended expedition into one of the deepest redoubts of the Amazon um, in, in, in his capacity as head of the Department of Isolated Indians to track this very mysterious group um, known only as the Arrow People, um, the Flecheros, the people of the Arrow. No one actually knows what this group calls itself because there's never been peaceful contact with them. No one knows what language they speak because the only dialogue that's ever existed between them and the outside world is one of flying bullets in one direction and flying arrows in the other. And Pozuelo was about to embark on an open-ended journey, as I said, into the, um, into the uh, Javari Valley Indigenous uh, Reserve, which is an enormous wilderness area in far western Brazil, um, 33,000 square miles, uh, roughly half the size of the Floridian Peninsula, maybe a total population estimated at about 4,500 people, um, including, um, uh, including um, several uncontacted groups. In fact, in the Javari Valley, um, the Javari Valley, this land of 33,000 square miles, hosts the largest concentration of uncontacted tribes anywhere in Brazil, in the Amazon, and hence the world. There are uh, 18 confirmed clearings, uh, malocas, uh, belonging to uncontacted groups, um, and those 18 clearings pertain to at least eight distinct ethnicities. Brazil, um, the Department of Isolated Indians, which keeps track of the, you know, the, the, the uncontacted tribes, has confirmed the existence of 26 uncontacted groups in Brazil. At the time of the expedition I was on, the number was 17. It has since grown to 26 confirmed groups. Eight of them are in this area alone, the Javari Valley. And as I uh, mentioned before, we would be going to explore the land of this particularly mysterious group, the Flecheros, or People of the Arrow, who inhabit a number of um, malocas in the southern stretches, um, the most impenetrable reaches of the Javari Reserve. So uh, the, um, the expedition would, um, would first proceed up river, um, up, up a tributary of, the, of a tributary called the Itakwai. Uh, these are um, typical Amazonian river boats, and Pozuelo had assembled a large expedition virtually on the um, level of like a Lewis and Clark style expedition with um, several, um, with three dozen men. Uh, and uh, we proceeded uh, first up river in these expedition boats um, f up the Itakwai heading south. And as we went up the Itakwai, um, this is an area that um, has, um, uh, on the one hand, um, 
uh, as we go up the Itaquaí, the expedition left from Tabachinga around the border of Brazil, uh, Brazil Peru, and Colombia. And as we go up the Itaquaí, uh, we're threading the needle between two uncontacted groups, actually, uh, off to our right as we're heading south on the, to the west are, uh, uh, is a group known as the Headbashers, the Karubo, who use uh, war clubs uh, to um, launch their attacks on adversaries and any, any unsuspecting intruders into their land. And on the other side of the river to the, to the east are the um, Arrow people and uh, who are also known to uh, tenaciously defend their land from intruders with their uh, arrows. And um, so we, um, we went through a number of Connemarie uh, Indian villages on our way up the Itaquaí. And as we went, um, they shared their food with us, such as this Cayman. Um, as we went through the Connemarie villages, Pozuelo c recruited uh, a number of the Connemarie to the expedition. So but by the time we left the very last Connemarie village, we had um, uh, six Connemarie scouts with us and, um, and uh, two Marubo, and then a dozen uh, Matisse Indians. The Matisse had only been contacted within the last 25 years, and it was very interesting because several of them um, with us were old enough to remember life pre-contact, and they offered great insights into, for example, what the Arrow people might be thinking about us uh, because they themselves uh, could remember a time before contact and what they thought of different phenomenon such as airplanes crossing their sky. And there were um, 10 non-Indian um, or mixed-blooded frontiersmen, uh, Ribeirinos, such as this uh, man here, Soldado, who turned out to be my best friend on the trip, my most trusted uh, confidant and the um, most um, trusted scout that Pozuelo had. So by the time we left the last um, of the Connemarie villages, Pozuelo had assembled a group of 35, 34 men, uh, including 20 Indians from three different tribes, Matisse, Marubo, Connemarie, and the 10 uh, non-Indian frontiersmen. Uh, there were a couple of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, he wanted to have a broad range of um, indigenous languages represented in the expedition in the case of an inadvertent contact with the Arrow people. Since no one knows what the language the Arrow people speak, perhaps if we had an, an encounter with them, one of the groups that we were with might be able to make themselves understood to the Arrow people. Um, I also came to understand in the course of the expedition that Pozuelo was also trying to forge like a pan-Indian consciousness among the different groups who inhabit the Javari. These, these groups, the Matisse, Marubo, and Connemarie are three of the um, seven contacted tribes that live inside the bounds of the Javari as well. So he was also trying to forge a consciousness among the Indians to defend their lands against the white intruder. And uh, as we went deeper upriver, uh, we had to leave those larger expedition boats behind as the water uh, dropped and the river got narrower. We passed on to these um, smaller shallow draft skiffs. And as we did so, um, in leaving the last of the Connemary villages behind, we proceeded into an area completely wild beyond uh, the reach of, of so-called civilization, passing across the frontier into the completely wild Amazon. The area that we entered, the Connemary themselves uh, would say, you know, there are um, dangerous people up there, wild Indians. They don't want to be tamed, and um, we don't go up there. And um, as we did proceed deeper into the, um, up the Itaquaí, we encountered uh, dozens of trees that had been swept off the riverbanks and forming a, um, essentially a protective barrier that um, was uh, very clear evidence that we were breaching um, you know, the, the, um, the confines of the um, wild Amazon, breaking our way forward. Dozens of trees having been swept off the riverbank over a period of years. You could see that some of these trees were very old, uh, just a testament to how long it had been since any uh, intruders, um, outsiders, had actually made their way up into this part of the, um, of the jungle. Oh, yeah, that, and, you know, there's a, somebody taking a nap.
Uh, and as we did, <laughs> yeah. Um, and as we did, there's um, that's a fresh jaguar print there on the sand. Uh, and we eventually, so uh, having, when we finally got to a place where the, the, even those shallow draft boats could go no further, they were left behind and sent back. And we began this very arduous uh, overland trek through the land of the Aero people. And um, what we um, soon discovered was this, this was a, um, a territory crisscrossed by streams uh, where the birthplace of four uh, separate interlocking river systems. And so we were essentially trekking across um, the headwaters of four separate rivers and the divide, the ridges, the ridge lines that would divide them. And it was an area where um, uh, you can see me there having a really great time crossing one of these streams. Uh, uh, and there's me having fun crossing another one, this time by foot, very much easier for sure. Um, but this water is so pure that you could dip your cup in it and drink straight from, straight from the, um, the streams. Um, and as we continued on, we're um, following the lead scouts who are hacking open. This is virgin jungle. And the lead scouts are hacking it open with their machetes, and then we're following single file, 34 men following them through this very um, uh, impenetrable, virtually impenetrable jungle. Um, and it, this is an area, as I said, where four separate rivers are born, and so the, um, the um, terrain is extremely difficult. We're going up and down, up and down, um, and in many instances, um, progressing only two miles a day because the um, terrain is so difficult and the vegetation so dense that their lead scouts are breaking open. As we um, proceeded deeper into the, uh, and this is um, also a painful lesson I learned, the, 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 the land here um, is virtually completely saturated, the, uh, the air. Um, it's almost like 90 nine percent humidity is like moving in a vast terrarium and uh, little did I realize that you couldn't actually leave a roll of film in your camera overnight without the film sticking to itself and you would end up losing the roll because um, you couldn't rewind it and um, that happened to me on several a couple of times um, so um, anyway and we we'd see some very amazing things like these mushrooms filled with rainwater um, like a hobbit's ta table um, and uh, we would stop to make camp around three every afternoon, which would give enough time to the, some of the men would um, be charged with creating the infrastructure for the camp, uh, setting up the kitchen area, sometimes making benches to sit on, um, a stairway down to the water source, even washing platforms out on the, on the, on the water, um, and then others would be assigned the detail of going off to hunt. There was a period of uh, about a week when the only thing our men could find to eat were monkeys. And um, so it was kind of this grim situation where we were tromping through a land of permanent twilight, basically. Uh, and um, the grisly task of, um, of butchering those animals and, and throwing them in a pot to boil fell to this man on the left, Mauro, who... Uh, and Mauro and Paolo next to him, they were the expedition cooks who would artlessly kind of hack, you know, the, our, our fare up into, you know, chunks and throw it in a pot and boil it until it would be, you know, come out this sort of rubbery piece of gristle. Um, and that would be our, our uh, evening dinner. Um, and Mauro one night um, woke the entire campsite up with his shrieking and... Uh, the next morning, he confided in me. It was something he evidently didn't want everyone to know, but he took me aside and he said, Senor Scotch. That's right, everyone called me Scotch, Scotchy. He said, Senor Scotch, I had this very bad dream last night. The monkeys were coming at me. They pinned me to a tree, and he, the, one of them had my knife, and he went to castrate me, and that's when I woke up screaming. <laughs> that was sort of one of the low points. Uh, and um, so this is me kind of early on in the trip, and this is me about uh, three weeks later, 
having shed about um, 30 pounds uh, in the process on that monkey meat diet. Um, and in the meantime, as we are making our way deeper and deeper into the jungle, we are encountering uh, vestiges, vestigios of the arrow people, including this ceramic pot that we discovered one day at a, an abandoned, abandoned fishing camp. And uh, we started seeing lots of uh, vestiges of the group, uh, including also this tapir jaw that had been left uh, in the cleft of a tree. And um, as we encountered more of these vestiges, the men we were with and Pozuelo himself could take a look at, you know, an abandoned camp or discarded baskets, and they could pretty much instantly date the, um, the you know, when, when it had been left behind, when these people had trekked through the forest. The other, the most common vestige actually were what they, um, what are referred to as quebradas, which are snapped saplings that um, people who are walking through the forest break these off as they walk at sort of hand level and snap branches to mark their trail so they can come back the same way, uh, kind of like Hansel and Gretel leaving breadcrumbs. And uh, we'd see a lot of these, and depending on how much the bark had, re had grown back over these snapped uh, green branches, that would be also be a clue as to how long ago um, one of these, um, a group of these um, indigenous people had passed through there. And there was always a re assumed, you know, it was always, uh, well, this is from last rainy season or last dry season, or this is from you know, a couple of months ago, or uh, this, these are maybe two weeks old, and this is, oh, maybe a couple of days, until um, uh, one day when one of our scouts, this guy, Ivan Arapa, uh, sees a fresh uh, footprint perfectly embedded in the mud right at his feet, and he said, this is from right now. And so right up ahead, we could hear, we actually could hear voices um, in, the, in, the, in the bush, not far from us, just ahead of us. And so um, at that point, our ranks, although you know this was kind of curious behavior because the objective of the expedition was to avoid making contact with the arrow people, but in the excitement to catch a glimpse of these wild Indians, suddenly our ranks broke and everyone started running like in their direction. And, um, and at this, uh, and actually two of our lead scouts cited uh, two um, Indians, naked Indians, who at a point, there was a footbridge that had been created by a log falling across the river from our side of this river and another one from exactly the opposite side and had, they'd actually formed a bridge, um, which the um, arrow people evidently used as a transit point because they had vines strung between the branches that protruded from these prostrate logs, and it was evidently like a you know a place where they crossed the river frequently. So at this point, Pozuelo, um, first of all, he called an Indian from each of our you know tribes represented in our group, a Kanamari, a Marubo and Machis to come forward and shout out into the bush to tell these um, arrow people, you know, to say in their language, we come in peace, we're not enemies, we're not going to hurt you, we're just passing through. And they didn't say anything and they took off and they dashed across this bridge where at the, right at the bridgehead, Pozuelo ordered to, uh, these pots to be strung there um, as a way of saying thank you to the, um, to the arrow people there and to demonstrate our peaceful intentions kind of a twist on the traditional methods used by certainistas to make contact where they would do this. Um, they'd set up, you know, um, in, in previous uh, epochs, the certainistas would set up these offering huts in the middle of the bush and um, put out gifts and let the Indians, you know, take them. Um, and, well, until they started taking them, because many times they wouldn't, and in inst many instances would actually smash the gifts and just leave them discarded on the ground to demonstrate their rage at the, uh, at the intruders. Um, and sometimes would even maybe leave a de dead animal on the trail uh, rather than take the gifts. And sometimes like even like a monkey for its obvious um, semblance to the human body, um, um, there were instances where monkeys would be left with um, an arrow in the, in the heart, you know, kind of like a voodoo doll. Um, just as a way of saying, no, thank you, we don't want your gifts, get out of here. 
So um, anyway, but uh, we left those gifts there, and from that moment on, we knew that we were being watched, and we knew that the, that they knew that we were there. And since the Arrow people, the Flecheros, uh, have never um, been very welcoming to any outsiders, which, by the way, um, is perfectly understandable because uh, the um, the face of white society that they know as in, you know as all the indigenous people practically of the Amazon and elsewhere in the Americas know the face of you know European occupation has always been one of death and violence and the the um, what what they know of previous intrusions into their territory um, were largely loggers commercial fishermen looking to um, take whatever they could and um, and to um, you know, uh, take it violently. And so uh, pre before this land was demarcated by the Brazilian government, there were um, loggers in there that frequently clashed with the Arrow people. Um, and, you know, the, there, were, there were several instances where loggers would end up being shot through with arrows. Nobody was keeping track of how many um, of the indigenous population um, were killed by, by the intruders. But it was obviously many more than the reverse. Um, so two days later, after this initial uh, sighting of the uh, tribesmen who dashed across the footbridge, uh, we came to uh, a footpath and we started down this path because it was going in the same direction that um, Pozuelo was leading this expedition by compass. And so he'd look at his compass and point the lead scouts um, to the place where they would begin slashing open the jungle and we'd all file a single file until um, two days after this incident. That, now this is three weeks after we left the boats behind. Three weeks of punishing uh, trekking through this very rugged area um, where um, two of our um, scouts um, disappear. Suddenly we followed a path um, that was remarkable because in the middle of the jungle to to find a well-worn footpath, but we came upon this path and we started following it because it was going in the same direction that Pozuelo's compass pointed. And he said, oh, let's follow this for a while, give ourselves a break. So we started down this path and we had been on it maybe 15 minutes or so when we came to a place where a sapling had been kind of like cracked, bent over and was leaning across the path, hanging by like a shred of bark. And Pozuelo pulled up short and said, Wow, this is universal language in the jungle. It means don't go any further. We must be getting close to their village. Uh, we're not going to, you know, we're gonna, we want to do what they say. So he ordered the expedition to veer off at a right angle from that point off the path and back into, you know, the boot sucking mud and the, um, and the over the branches swarming with fire ants. And we, we, we got to a point, and then we continued slogging through that for a half an hour and then stopped to wait for everyone to catch up as we were moving single file through the jungle. The men would stagger in in groups of two and three um, and drop their loads and collapse on the jungle floor. And we were waiting there for an hour, and two of our guys, including this one, who was actually my porter, um, didn't show up. And so we waited an hour, and at that point, Pozuelo dispatched a, sh a search party. And so they went off, uh, and they didn't come back. And, uh, and then he sent another party out, and they didn't come back. And so one of, one of Pozuelo's uh, calculations was that we would have enough men and enough weaponry to dissuade the Indians from attacking us. Uh, the guiding principle of the Indian Protection Service and FUNAI is die if you must, but never kill. There was no intention to ever fire on the Arrow people. The standing orders were, if we were attacked, to fire warning shots in the air only, not to return fire. Um, and uh, so at that point, um, these, so, you know, we were waiting for these two guys to come to, to, to show up, and they didn't, and the search parties went out. And now the, the, the principle of numeric superiority, you know, that we had this kind of large force that would dissuade the Arrow people from attacking us had kind of broken down a little bit because now we were, like, spread out in, like, three or four, five, actually, groups. And um, two of our guys were missing. And eventually a couple of the scouts came back, and they reported that, 
um, at that roadblock that the flecheros had left, the footprints of our guys, this one, uh, Alfredo, and uh, his friend Wilson, both Connemary Indians, had gone straight through this roadblock, and they completely had ignored this, you know, gate, and um, it led through down the path through these enormous gardens where they had planted manioc, sugarcane, uh, bananas, and then led into a settlement with uh, more about a dozen huts. 10 feet high and sloping down thatched huts to the ground. The, the Indians had fled moments before, leaving smoldering campfires, uh, piles of meat, like five different types of monkey and tapir and wild boar and uh, turtle eggs and caterpillars, and it had evidently been preparing a feast. Uh, they obviously couldn't run with them, but they had left behind and tried to hide, covering them with leaves, a couple of large vats, ceramic vats, brimming with karari, um, the poison that they put on their arrow tips. And, um, and most ominously and disturbing, the, f the footprints of our companions led out through the village um, and then down a trail on the backside of the village and then just vanished. Just the footprints are there and they're gone which was astonishing because our, you know, the Indians we were with and the frontiersmen, they're all expert trackers, and they just, they couldn't understand it. They were like, they could, the only thing they could, they could conceive of was that these guys had just been snatched off their feet and had disappeared, had been abducted or killed. And so uh, we ourselves prepared to face an, an attack because we thought, well, they've killed these guys. They're going to expect that we're going to retaliate and avenge their deaths. So they're going to launch a preemptive attack against us. So this was like this moment of deep tension uh, in the jungle. And um, eventually, um, it resolved itself. Um, but not without us noticing ominously that the Arrow people were not only following us at that point, but it actually leapfrogged ahead of us as evidenced by this crude canoe that they had pulled down river. Um, it's a um, Pashuba um, palm uh, hollow trunk um, canoe, actually a couple of trunks lashed together with vines and um, um, uh, moored, moored to the side of the river by these poles. So not only were they behind us following us, but they were also ahead of us. Uh, and at this point, um, what, what next happened was after their settlement was entered, Pozuelo called a forced march and we just basically double timed it for um, several days, for three days after that initial, uh, after that um, incident at their village. Uh, we continued along the banks of the Jutai River um, to a point where um, Pozuelo called, called a halt to the march and, and at that point, our men began building um, uh, kind of like semi-permanent installations where we would spend the next two weeks while um, our men set about building uh, dugout canoes. We had gotten to a point where it was way too dangerous to go back the same way we had come in. It would have been far too much of a provocation to the Arrow people to cross back through their lands. And in fact, the um, plan envisioned um, doing exactly what we did, was, which was to get to an adjacent river system. Although Pozuelo didn't know which one we were actually going to find ourselves on, we found ourselves eventually on the banks of the Jutai River where we made this camp and where the men set about um, from scratch. Now the power tools had gone back when we went back. To, when the boats turned around on the Itakwai River a month ago, uh, five weeks ago actually, the boats took the power tools back. So. All we had were um, axes and adzes and machetes. And with these tools, the men set about building um, these uh, dugout canoes. In the end, one was 60 feet long um, on the order of the Haida Canoe in the Museum of Natural History in New York, and the other 47 feet long. And uh, this was, um, these would be our ticket out of the jungle because we were still way too deep uh, for any kind of extraction by any other means. And um, so uh, we um, 
in the course of these two weeks, they not only hollowed out the canoes as you just saw, but then in order to make these, um, these um, vessels actually water worthy, um, the ancient art of making a dugout canoe requires that they are then opened, uh, the hulls are opened with fire. The fire is used to make the wood malleable and then the hulls are pried apart. All of this done strictly with hand tools, no power tools whatsoever. And so um, after two weeks of, um, and, and the paddles were all made by hand as well. And um, meanwhile, we were enjoying uh, the bounty um, that the jungle had to offer, such as uh, piranha and um, catfish, uh, and uh, piraruku, um, also known as paiche. And um, eventually, um, the boats had to be launched, and they were built, you know, one was like a um, half a kilometer, I guess, about 500 meters from the water, and the other, they were both about that far from the water. So in order to actually get them to the river um, required um, something kind of akin to like building a Roman road in northern Gaul like 2,000 years ago. Um, the, the sheer manpower um, pulling these things over, um, over rollers to get, the, uh, to get the vessels to the river. And then um, once, we, uh, once the canoes were ready to go, um, we, would, uh, we were then undertaking the third phase of the expedition, which called for us to paddle uh, down the uh, Jutai River um, and out of the reserve to a point where we could be extracted by boat, where the river was deep enough for um, our um, uh, extraction. So after two weeks, um, of building the canoes. This is our mo the morning we um, were departing the main camp. You can see those little docks that the men have built. Those have been our like washing platforms for the last couple of weeks. One of the canoes um, you can see has a canopy over the middle of it. That's the canoe that the uh, Matisse built. And we leave behind um, some interesting installations um, for the Arrow people to ponder. Um, it was virtually certain that as soon as we left there, um, they were in, um, in on the camp um, looking uh, at everything. And so here are the canoes, the two canoes freshly launched on the river. And uh, the, um, the journey required now um, nearly two weeks uh, paddling 10, 12, 15 hours a day uh, to get downriver to a point that would be deep enough for the boats to come get us. Uh, and, ha you know, after more than a month of being, um, you know, in this permanent twilight beneath a jungle canopy, now we were exposed to the blistering sun um, during the day and, um, and frequent downpours, uh, although every morning there w it would be like this with mist on the river, uh, always. You can never see the sun uh, come up. It would always burn its way through mist. Um, and uh, so... Once we, um, and th th I, the pictures you've seen and the photographs that are in my book are, uh, I took, but um, the magazine had assigned a photographer to the journey, Nicholas Renard. Um, in the magazine, you'll see his photographs. Um, this is uh, one I shot of him as he was setting up what, ter what was one of the lead m photographs in the magazine. Um, he died a year later in, the, in a plane crash in the Amazon outside of Manaus. Um, I, on assignment. There you can see, um, you get a good um, view of the um, canopy in the middle of the Matisse canoe. And so um, I show this photograph because, you know, when we, when we uh, two months earlier, when we came up the Itakwai in our boats, you know, it was clear we were coming upriver into the Connemary villages and we were, you know, kind of welcomed as heroes. We had lots of gifts and trade goods with us to distribute to the natives. And we were, you know, like emissaries from, you know, the metropolitan, you know, areas. And, uh, and but it was a completely different story coming out um, on the Jutai, coming from the far side of the frontier, having not gone up the Jutai to begin with. 
you know, when we first encountered our first, you know, encounter with Economary Village, it was something akin to like the longships appearing on the Frankish coast like a thousand years ago. People scattered in panic. They couldn't, ha they had no clue as to who we were or what we were doing there. You know, this odd mix of indigenous people in camouflage uniforms. These two enormous battleships, basically, bigger than anything that they'd seen before, certainly. Um, and this was one of the first um, Connemary settlements we came to on the Jutai. And um, interestingly, uh, in this village, there were tribesmen, actually a couple of families, men and women and children of the Som Japa tribe, which is basically an uncontacted group. But the Connemary themselves actually made contact with, lured, um, seduced, some of them with um, bags of salt and fish hooks. They actually didn't use the fish hooks, but they liked the salt, and they kept leaving bags of salt closer and closer and closer to their village till one day the people actually came into their village. And they, they essentially press ganged. What they did was, so they, they were the ones who made contact with these, with these Som Japa. Most of, the, most of their relatives are still out in the bush. And this was like a nightmare for Pasuelo when he saw this you know, contact going on. This man probably has no better than a one in two chance of surviving um, the, the germs that you know, will, will have or had already been transmitted to him. But the Connemary having um, been in large measure um, stripped of their um, traditional knowledge and culture, no longer knew how to make bows and arrows, much less hunt with them. They were now completely dependent on Funai's paternalism um, you know, for, for s basic goods that, you know, our society, white society created for them, which they did not ever need before. But now, for example, they, they only know how to sh sh hunt with shotguns, but um, since Funai almost never gets up to this place, it's so remote, and they can't get down river because they have no gasoline to do it, they don't have any shotgun shells left, and they don't have any means to hunt. So they'd actually press ganged the Som Japa into doing their hunting for them with their bows and arrows. So they're depend they kind of in in enslave these people to, to provide for their um, sustenance. Uh, and so after um, all that trip in the canoe, we were picked up by a river boat and returned by motor boat, which was another 10 days. Uh, bringing us back finally to Tabachinga and the end of the expedition nearly three months after it began. And um, with that, um, I'll take your questions and thank you very much. Scott, thank you. Uh, it is, it's one hell of a story. Um, and as y you all heard, there were um, <laughs> opportunities for, in some respects, life-threatening and life-changing moments around every corner. Um, but I, I perhaps start with a question to, to, to kick off the conversation to have you talk about it. As someone who's covered a number of conservation and environment stories, um, what you saw as the, the de facto impact of a policy that was obviously aimed and focused on the uncontacted tribes, but given the, um, the importance of the, of the expedition to figure out exactly where they were, and, uh, to demarcate it and then keep people out, yeah. um, a, a word about that and then how that connects to some of the larger conservation right. questions that that um, you deal with in the book and that I know a number of people here in the audience are interested in. Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 the story, one of the things that's so fascinating and compelling about it, as far as I'm concerned, is y here you have um, a, the intersection, really, of indigenous rights, human rights, and environmental conservation. Uh, Pozzuolo himself sa you know, said, uh, in protecting uh, these uncontacted um, tribes, you are protecting 
hundreds of thousands of acres of biodiversity. In fact, the Department of Isolated Indians um, has jurisdiction over 50,000 square miles of primal forest in the Amazon. It's an area roughly the size of New York State that remains to this day uh, virtually untouched because it is protected and, um, and watched over by the Department of Isolated Indians. So it's a, it's a very neat sort of um, interplay between environmental protection and human rights. Clearly, um, the people who are um, in these jungles uh, are making a, a willful decision not to seek contact with the outside world. Um, one of the things that I um, should have mentioned uh, earlier is that this whole region was very convulsed in the late 19th century, early 20th century by the global, the soaring global demand for rubber, for wild rubber. The Amazon and the Congo were basically the two places in the world where wild rubber was available in, in abundance. And so as you had a series of technological breakthroughs and advances in the mid 19th century, the tire, the pneumatic tire, the bicycle, the automobile, all the uses that rubber had for gaskets, for insulating telegraph wires and electrical wires, sent legions of rubber tappers deep into the Amazon, and essentially places that had not been explored by colonizers before. And when they encountered indigenous villages, uh, they actually rounded them up. They, they were also looking for not only the, the rubber, but the, ma the la labor to tap it. And so entire villages were, were abducted, um, and those who tried to get away gunned down. And it's almost for sure in almost every instance that the uncontacted tribes that continue to hold forth today are the descendants of the survivors of those slaving raids and massacres. You, you, um to, to follow that theme of some of the threats from the outside, today uh, one of them are the miners, and you had quite a, a, a what shall we say, not really a confrontation, but a discovery on the river at the mm. kind of back end of that trip. Perhaps you could talk about that yeah. in the context of the additional challenges. Uh, that was very interesting. So um, after, just after we passed outside the bounds of the protected area, uh, we encountered one morning uh, a gold dredge um, on the working the side of the river. These things are incredibly destructive environmentally. They're they, the, these wildcat operations where the dredge digs its way into the river bank and spews out um, the effluent and separates out gold through a series of sluices. Uh, and there are um, hundreds, if not thousands, of these contraptions operating illegally um, in wide stretches of the uh, Brazilian and the Amazon in general. And uh, they, they are very uh, destructive environmentally and they are almost always illegal, but very unregulated. And rarely does anyone do anything about them. Law enforcement rarely gets out to places as far out as we were. So Pozuelo effectively deputized um, the 34 men that we were with. He put them under arms with you know uniforms. And so in the early morning hours, we, um, at first light, we actually waited. We saw where the dredge was and waited overnight. And at dawn the next morning, while there was still mist on the river, we fell on this gold dredge. And you, know, you should have seen the jaws drop on these people as you know, you'd see these um, you know, indigenous people in camouflage uniforms with shotguns boarding their gold dredge. Uh, and we seized it, and we took it. We, we, you know, we took it all the way down to the mouth of the Jutai River, where the nearest city was, which was, we it was still like six days away, um, and turned it over to the federal police there. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it, it struck me that even then, your level of certainty as to what would happen to it and who owned it, and, <laughs> and uh, exactly. that wasn't the end of the story. That wasn't the end of the story, and we don't know. I don't know how long. It could have been only, you know, a few, a matter of a few days before it was back operating again. Uh, law enforcement is very weak, and the power of people who have, you know, money and influence is very strong. And you know, the day that we left Jutai to continue on our way back to Tabachinga, the owner of the dredge was due to arrive in a private, you know, plane from Manaus. 
Um, no doubt thinking he was going to be able to spring the gold dredge with, by passing out a little largesse probably. Although um, there was one promising thing and that was the Indian, I mean the, the police deputy in, um, in Jutai had arrived there only a short time before and hadn't yet been, you know, corrupted and probably hadn't been there long enough to be in the back pocket of anyone yet. And so Pozuelo was hoping that this guy might be able to actually resist the, you know, the influence of this man. How do you to take and find ways to apply as we plug into the different aspects of this story? You know, one of the things that I, w really strikes me a lot is that where there is a will to protect the Amazon, it can be done. Um, we often hear that it's just inevitable, the, the deforestation, the, the environmental destruction, and that nothing can be done about it. I think um, what we saw, what I saw in this area of the Javari is when there is a commitment to do something and the resources are made available to do it, um, that you know what seems like an ine inevitable development, um, the overrunning of these forests, you can actually do something to, to, to stop that. And, and, and not only there, but you see in satellite imagery, um, and there's also been a new study, I think that's uh, the World Bank commissioned, that indigenous lands, um, the indigenous people in the Amazon are very effective stewards of the rainforest. And um, you, if you look at satellite imagery um, from outer space of areas in the Amazon, you can see where indigenous lands um, end um, is where the environmental destruction begins. And you know you can actually see a line from, from, from an airplane. You can see oh, on this side is indigenous land because it's you know, intact forest right up to the boundary. And on the other side, it's unprotected and it's been completely plundered. Well, why don't we turn the conversation up to our folks here. Teresa, why don't we start on this side and get a couple of them. Again, if you could just let us know who you are before posing your question. My name is Donna Sandin. I'm a translator, Portuguese to English. Spent about eight years in Brazil a long time ago. Uh, you said you were asked to portray drought profile of Pochuela, but how did that jump happen from profiling him to being allowed to go with him on this expedition? Uh, I think the thought was that the best way to profile him would be to actually observe him doing his job. Uh, I have to say, though, the initial um, idea was that I would just follow him um, on the upriver portion of the trip. Um, when we were still on the river, our satellite phone still worked. It ceased working once we set off in the jungle. But I had a conversation with the geographic. Um, we were getting to the point where we were going to have to leave the boats behind more quickly than uh, anyone had thought. And I didn't really feel like I had a story yet. And I said to my editor, I, I said, I don't think we can write a story that says, and with that, Sidney Pozuelo went off into the jungle and National Geographic went home. So, uh, you know, as, as, much of a, as, a, as much as it threw my entire life into complete disarray and despite the attendant risks, um, I just thought, you know, there was, there was nothing I could do other than go, go on, you know, full, to both feet in. Yeah. You want to talk about what a challenge he was, though, as a, as a person to, you know, characterize, to describe? Yeah, I, I still, I don't know, I, you know, I'm not sure how Sidney's going to react to this book yet. He hasn't, we've just sent him some copies, but he's, we, we, that he's actually going to send to people he knows to read. So, you know, I, I didn't sugarcoat Sidney at all in this book, and um, he was, he's a difficult man, uh, and he's especially difficult man to be under the command of for three months in isolation. Uh, great for literature, not so great for, you know, actually, like, being with him for that time. Um, th these are extreme conditions we were in. Everyone was... Um, you know, in many moments, very tense. There was always danger. Uh, he could be explosive and temperamental and brooding. And because he was the leader of the journey, um, you know, when his mood was dark, everyone's, everyone's mood was dark. And that, you know, that was a fair amount of time, I have to say. But I, I will say this, you know, he brought us in there and he got us out. 
And I think, you know, only uh, someone who exercises, you know, something like the iron-fisted, um, you know, command that he does um, probably could have done that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's another question right there, sir. Uh, Peter Knight, I work in Rio de Janeiro and here, uh, did some work in Acre on, on a, something called the digital forest. In any case, uh, I was curious, uh, if this took place in two, 2003, 2004, uh, has there been any follow-up, have you seen, aside from, from the satellites, uh, what's happened to this area and uh, whether they've successfully maintained it? And, yeah. And then those people who disappeared, uh, you said you, they were never found, I assume, or they, they were? <laughs> uh, uh, there's a book outside okay, I, that you can... <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. The, um, so there's probably not um, ever going to be, there's quite likely never going to be an expedition of the sort that we were on back in that area again. Pozuelo's um, mission was to explore it and then put it off limits forever, if possible. But what has been seen in recent, uh, in more recent times, first of all, um, the Arrow people appear to be thriving. Um, the, the size of their Malocas has increased. There are actually more numbers of them. And one of them has actually been relocated to the banks of the Jutai itself, which has to, um, which could only happen if they are feeling very secure. To actually bring one of their villages down to the banks of the Jutai, which is the river that was our um, path of egress out of the Javari means that they are, you know, thriving and doing quite well, which was actually what we discovered also in that inadvertent entry into their village, that they seem to be doing well. Um, for all I know, but I don't really know for sure, they may have relocated their, um, their settlement to the, you know, main camp that we cleared where, where we were when we built the canoes. So it's also in the same area, very close to where we were, that uh, Funai, that the Department of Isolated Indians earlier this year announced the discovery of a new settlement. Um, so, and, and potentially a new um, tribe that had um, not been known about before. So at least in that part of the Amazon, the, the story seems to be um, a good one. Thank you. A lot over there, and we'll come down here. Please. So what information did he get that was really important that you feel you couldn't have gotten, or he couldn't have gotten by flyovers or satellite? Right. So the flyovers will tell you, you know, you can pinpoint um, the location of a, of a clearing from a flyover. What the flyover will not tell you is the extent of the um, of a people's wanderings, how, what their essentially economic frontiers are, how far they go during the seasonal migrations to look for fish or turtle eggs or whatever. So he was able to get he was able to create a map, essentially of their territorial boundaries, uh, and he also wanted to look for any imminent threats. Were there uh, intruders were infiltrators coming into the reserve from from the south, which is the main the main concern from the Jurua River, which is to the south, and so we were looking for possible infiltrations by loggers or poachers or um, gold prospectors, and found that there were none. So those were the two main things that we achieved without, which we couldn't have gotten from the air. Okay, gentlemen down here. Yeah, Leon Kalankowitz, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Central America in the late 80s and spent a fair amount of time with indigenous tribes in the Mosquitia region straddling the border between an area Nicaragua I know well. and Honduras, uh, uh, Pesh Indians, the Mosquitoes themselves, etc. I was curious about the level of support on the part of the Brazilian people towards protecting vast swaths of the Amazon on behalf of indigenous uh, tribes in those areas. I had heard um, uh, disconcertingly over the years that there was some resentment. Why are we tying up large areas of land for such small numbers of people? A, a, a corollary to that is what would the estimate of population sizes be of, of some of these tribes or yeah. villages? Uh, 
fairly small from, right. from what I gather. So the, the, um, as, as a matter of fact, the flecheros, the arrow people, they have um, six, seven settlements that probably have um, an average of 50 or 60 people in each. Um, so there probably, there may be as many as 400 of them, four or 500, which is actually a pretty good number. Um, some of the other groups are obviously much smaller and probably too small to even have genetic viability to assure um, you know, a future beyond this generation or the next or the next. Uh, as far as the support for this kind of policy in Brazil, um, I think that uh, you know, the closer you get to a frontier, the more uh, adamant the mood gets as far as the, 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 the support for indigenous protection and for the protection of, um, of natural areas um, definitely uh, dwindles the closer you get to a frontier. So, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the cities, in the south, there is a fair amount of support, I would say, for these kinds of policies. As you get closer to the areas where the people are most impacted, where sawmills are silent because they can't get at the trees that are in those reserves, that's where you have intense pressure to open up the areas. That's where FUNAI, IBAMA, the Natural uh, Resources uh, Protection Agency, are the most vilified and where it's actually dangerous to be you know, an agent from you know, the federal government in, in many instances, the resentment is so high for the work they're doing. Thank you very much. I'm James Hill. I'm from the Pan American Health Organization. Uh, I've recently done a lot of reading about explorers that had been into remote areas looking for El Dorado, et cetera. Mm. I was wondering if you could take some time to share with us a little bit. You mentioned the dangers and the risks. Uh, you were, I guess there was no fear that you might end up with an arrow through you. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and <laughs> also like to hear something about uh, the, the insects and some of the uh -huh. creature com discomforts that you had to deal with in, yeah. in traveling that area. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually the fear of an arrow was definitely there <laughs> at, at, at many instances. Um, there were... Uh, so as far as some of the more the nastier creatures, we um, encountered several bushmasters, snakes for de lance, um, coral snakes, um, which our men, you know, summarily um, dispatched. Um, there was. Uh, Although you should say, only because someone was paying attention, somebody else didn't get bitten. Oh, right? totally. It wasn't kind of a matter of fact. Oh yeah, I mean. Yes, and there, were, there was one instance where one of our scouts was sliding down a riverbank um, and a, a, a bushmaster um, went right for his jugular and he just managed, just managed to, to, um, to avoid it. Uh, as far as insects were concerned, I'd say the major, uh, the major discomfort was um, created by ants. We, there, were, there were a number of campsites that we, you know, that we try to camp usually by like three in the afternoon or so to allow the hunters time to go find dinner and get the campsite set up. But this, there were a couple of days where we couldn't find a decent place to camp, decent meaning, you know, relatively level ground, near a water source, um, relatively uh, dry. Um, and, you know, there was one afternoon where we, uh, Finally, you know, as the sun was just about to drop, it was going to be too late to hunt, and we were desperate and hungry and miserable. We came to this place, and it looked at first blush ideal, you know, this sort of glade with a burbling brook rushing through it, and, you know, grass and lots of trees to hang your hammocks. But the Indians were immediately like, no good, no good. And I'm like, well, what's the problem? And they pointed up in the trees. And, you look up there and they're you know, like 80 feet off the ground, these big like bulbous protrusions in the trees and they were like ants' nests. And they were like, no, we can't camp here. But Pozuelo was like, no, we're staying here. And so, you know, you tie your hammocks off to these trees and in no time they'd be, you know, the ants would be like invading, you know, the hammocks, coming, you know, marching down the hammock cords. And in our, in our, when, we, when we first set off from the uh, river and left the boats behind, we had to perform like a radical triage of our stuff. And um, so 
Um, we had like a case of repellent, but it all went back with the boats, except I sequestered one bottle of this pump spray. And that was the first time I broke it out. I didn't use it on my skin at all. But there, uh, spraying the hammock cords kept those ants, you know, at bay. They came down the cords and where the, you know, repellent was, they were twitching and, but they, 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 they held back. But along the ground, it was so miserable. I mean, th these were like really nasty ants too. They, they were like, you know, very um, vicious. Yeah. So I guess those were probably the worst. And then there are bullet ants with the stingers. You have to be really careful of the uh, bullet ants are like, a, like a, almost two inches long, an inch, two inches long with a stinger on their rear. Um, they can send you into, you know, shock, really painful. Um, so I guess those are probably the worst, um, the worst hazards of, of that sort to be on the lookout for. There were jaguars around. We saw their fresh prints all over the place. Uh, and um, that was a little freaky too because you know, uh, we spent two weeks um, in that one place building the canoes. And so the Matisse were building a canoe. It was about a 20 minute walk from the campsite along a trail following the river. And in the course of a couple weeks, with people going back and forth to that work site, you know, a well worn path was sort of trodden out there. And it, you had the, um, you know, because. Um, there was a path you could actually follow it without, you know, concern of being lost. Um, so it kind of lulled me into thinking, oh, you know, I can take that path whenever I want. But it, you know, one day I was out there alone, and I got out to, thinking I, they were going to be out there building the canoe. I went all the way out there alone, only to find like the work site was empty. They, I'd misunderstood where they were, and I had to come back again by myself. And Pozuelo had been talking about this jaguar that was like, you know, lurking about, and everybody had seen its footprints in the sand nearby. And all of a sudden it occurred to me, you know, I, well, I know where the path is. I know how to get back, but I'm alone out here, you know, and this is actually the wild. So there were, you know, that was another concern. Yeah. Okay. Ma'am, you've been waiting patiently. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Rafaela. I'm Brazilian, and um, I was born in Manaus, so I'm pretty familiar. So it was a very interesting lecture to attend to because I'm familiar with mm. a lot of words. <laughs> it was really good. So my question is, how do you evaluate the Brazilian Indian policy um, considering the interests of Brazil concerning uh, sovereignty and national defense and the uh, interests of the Indians of not being contacted at all. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I, I, you know, frankly, I think Brazil is to be commended for um, having this policy of um, protecting these tribes. Uh, I think, you know, it's certainly um, a more enlightened policy than, um, than one that's been um, uh, carried out in any of the other countries in the Amazonia region and perhaps anywhere uh, in, you know, the Americas. Uh, you know, certainly there are things that are um, cause for concern. I don't think um, the, the government um, devotes nearly enough resources to the programs and to, you know, protecting indigenous lands and to protect the rights of the indigenous people and to make sure that they are well taken care of. Uh, I think there are certainly a lot of things that could be improved. Um, but um, I think, you know, in principle, uh, there's a lot to commend for the policy, I would say. Okay, there was a, there was a hand, a gentleman down here. Yes, um, yeah, you mentioned that. <coughs> okay, Juan Luna, George Washington University, worked in the Amazon for three years um, when I worked for the Inter-American Development Bank. And I was curious to see whether um, this group of um, different tribes that was formed during the expedition with the uh, Matisse, the Manuvo, and the other tribes. Kind of Marie, yeah. yeah. If that's if that's being perpetuated, in other words, if this is a continue you know, part of the policy in terms of you know bringing together the locals in terms of protecting you know more vast mm -hmm. areas. Um, yeah, actually, so the Pasuelo's idea you know, in f trying to forge a pan-Indian consciousness, I think, is something that, you know, is not unique actually to Pozuelo or to what he was trying to do. There have been efforts um, beyond Funai. Um, there are some NGOs that are working in that region who are helping to bring together 
um, the various tribes in the region for you know regular conferences to discuss their common issues. Um, so uh, there, the, the, these efforts have continued. It's not just with those three. There are also a couple of other uh, tribes in the um, Jabari area that meet on a annual or perhaps semi-annual basis. Um, so yeah, I think that, that work does continue. Yeah, thanks. Um, yes, the gentleman in the back. Thank you, Rodrigo Valderrama, Plantation International. Uh, I understand that some of the forest people have a lot of contact with some of these tribes and that they are almost interlocutors, that they are, that they help them get their messages to the authorities, et cetera. Can you comment on that if there's anything? I, I think, you know, in some areas of the Amazon, that's probably true. Um, I don't think that's the case where we were. Uh, you know, in every instance that we, where we heard any where, where we heard any talk about the Arrow people, um, it was always one of trepidation. We don't, you know, that's their land. We don't go there. Uh, however, with, the, um, with that isolated group that had been um, lured into contact that we saw in the Connemarie village, um, it's quite possible. In fact, it would be, probably be to be expected that those people who are living in that village are now acting as some kind of interlocutors with the rest of the tribe that's still in the bush. That's probably um, virtually certain, I would think. So it, it's not a uniform situation. In some instances, you would have that kind of um, secondary contact, and in others, not at all. But w w one of the things that, um, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that in the past, these groups had, um, there was, you know, a fair amount of commerce um, the, 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 between all the different indigenous groups in this area, the isolation that they are living today is actually probably imposed by, you know, the colonization of these areas by the white man. The uh, traditional trade routes, the, 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 the routes of transportation now having been, you know, now that they are controlled by whites, make it too difficult to sustain intertribal uh, contact in many instances too dangerous, uh, and so you have um, you know a, a, a new kind of isolation that actually is perhaps a historically rather recent phenomenon. So, Scott, you've been out on the, the west coast, and uh, you had a presentation at National Geographic tomorrow. I think you're at Busboys and Poets here. In, yes, in, I am in Busboys and Poets at so six thirty. Tell your friends if they want to come uh, hear Scott tomorrow. But, uh, do you have some impressions from how the book is being received in these different different audiences? I, you know, I'm amazed at how much uh, interest there is uh, in this book. I just came back from the West Coast where Seattle and Portland have full house um, every night. Um, in San Francisco, lots of interest. Uh, there was at the Geographic, the Explorers Club here and in New York. There's a lot of interest in this topic. One of the main things that I'm concerned about. I, I, think it's, I think this is a book that's really important to, for people to read and to get the message out about, but um, there, are, um, there are impediments. Um, Barnes & Noble has put the book in the sociology section, which is almost like the kiss of death for a book, you know? Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> uh, so pull it off the shelf and put it on the front table. Yeah, that's what I'm sort of telling people to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a book I think that'll sell if people see it, but they have to be able to see it to buy it, you know. So, but, but um, I, I'm getting a lot of really terrific feedback, um, and, and there seems to be quite a lot of interest in the subject, you know. Are you going to have an opportunity to go down to Brazil and have conversations down there around? Well, the, so the book is going to be published in Brazil um, by Objectiva. Um, I guess next year, I'm waiting to have a direct conversation with the publisher there. Um, and I hope um, that I'll actually be going there. Probably doesn't uh, make sense to go there to talk about the book until the Brazilian edition is ready for publication. Yeah. Terrific. Well, Scott, we very much appreciate you uh, sharing this uh, story with us, both uh, here today but in writing. Uh, I know that I learned a lot and certainly enjoyed doing it. Uh, and so I urge all of you to, to, to do the same. Uh, and, of course, we thank you for... Um, 
coming to the center to, to do this and, and engaging with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, as I said before, I really appreciate the center's support for this work. It's definitely a um, better book because I was here. And um, I, I appreciate everything everyone's done here for me. And I thank everyone for coming. And I'd be happy to sign books um, after, after this. I'll come out and, you know, anyone who would like to purchase a book, it would be a great present to take to somebody for Christmas. I can, I can attest to that. <laughs> so won't you all join me in thanking Scott for Thank you. Thanks very much.